next talk will be by Paul Jaminey, who will really be starting up right where Dan left off um, in sleep and covering other aspects of circadian rhythms. Paul? Thanks a lot, Kamal. So, uh, uh, looks like we'll get uh, two views of a closely connected phenomena. So, I got very interested in circadian rhythms when uh, I started to realize how significant they were for health. Uh, it's very easy to lose at least six years of health by uh, anything that disrupts circadian rhythms, whether it's night shift work, uh, sleep apnea, lack of exercise, uh, peculiar eating patterns uh, and other uh, things that are not good for circadian rhythms. And uh, what's also fascinating to me about the circadian rhythm issue is how it pulls together so many things in uh, health. So here's just a comparison of the long-term consequences of disrupted sleep. Um, most of these experimental papers that uh, look at long-term long -term consequences of sleep loss are looking either at night shift workers or at people with sleep apnea. And you see that they have highly elevated rates of these various diseases. For instance, people with sleep apnea are 4.8 times more likely to develop cancer uh, than people who don't have sleep apnea. But what's curious is if you look at physical inactivity, and there are a lot of people who are physically inactive now, you get exactly the same roster of diseases uh, occurring in them at elevated rates compared to people who get regular activity. And the life expectancy cost is very similar. So you'd almost suspect that these are the same mechanism. They're really emphasizing the same uh, affecting the same aspects of biology, and uh, and that would provide a unified explanation uh, for these things. And in fact, uh, the obvious candidate is circadian rhythms. And I could show you a, a lot of other things. For instance, uh, in gene knockout mice, they can knock out circadian rhythm genes, and you see a lot of these diseases in mice. Uh, and also some others. For instance, when you knock out circadian rhythm genes, uh, animals get uh, joint disorders. So if you have any kind of joint disease, like uh, arthritis, for instance, first thing you should tend to is circadian rhythm. Um, all right, so I'd like to always approach things from a big picture perspective and an evolutionary biology perspective. Uh, so I'd like to start by addressing the question, why did circadian rhythms evolve, and why did they have such powerful effects on our health? Um, and actually, that's connected to another question, uh, which has puzzled many people. Uh, how can a uh, complex life form uh, from a fairly restricted set of biomolecules? Uh, for instance, how can DNA code for very complex, sophisticated beings? It only has a four-letter alphabet. Uh, it does have three billion nucleotides, but when you calculate how much information is contained in DNA, it's similar to 2,000 books or one-twelfth of Wikipedia. Uh, and you know, this has been a puzzle for a lot of people. It's a, it's a puzzle for, for instance, uh, creationists will often say, you know, oh, it's just impossible for this to, uh, you know, produce the complexity of a, of a human being. But it was also uh, a puzzle to many scientists. And, you know, so for instance, uh, there were many who believed that, that DNA could not code uh, for the human proteome because it just didn't have enough information. And, you know, so it, it took uh, actually a while to prove that DNA was really uh, the coding agent. Uh, so. Uh, you know, so this is a puzzle, and what's the solution, or one element of the solution to the puzzle? Uh, really, a book is, is not a good analogy for biology. And the reason is, uh, the information content of a book, uh, you have to look at the connections between uh, elements in a book. And a book has a linear structure. Uh, letters only have a uh, 
they only influence the meaning of the letter that is letters that are very close to them. Words only influence the meaning of the words that are adjacent to them. Uh, and so elements are only connected uh, to things that are close by. It's a very sparse network. There's a limited number of interactions between the elements. When you look in biology, you find the networks between the elements are always uh, very dense. So uh, you know, one gene interacts with many other genes. Proteins interact with many other proteins. Uh, and it's actually when we're talking about complexity in biology, it's really the number of interactions which is the best measure of complexity, uh, not uh, the number of uh, uh, molecules or nucleotides or genes. Um, and the uh, uh, number of elements, the number of possible commutations and permutations and combination scales, you know, quite highly. Now, if you think about any dense network where there's interactions, coordination becomes very important. And so here I've illustrated this just when moving a sofa. If you have something you know, that you need to do by yourself, you don't need any sort of coordination. But as soon as you get two entities that have to interact, their interactions need to be coordinated. So if one of these movers tries to lift his end of the sofa, but the other mover isn't lifting that end, uh, he can't move the sofa. And then if he puts his end down and the other one lifts his end up and tries to move it, the sofa won't move. Uh, and I actually moved the sofa not long ago and tried to move it from one end and I ended up uh, sliding it along the floor and scratching the floor. So even if you can move it, it may not work as well as it would if you did things with a proper interaction. So, and this is, you know, this is so much simpler uh, than the type of networks we have in biology where you have, you know, so many cells, so many molecules that have to interact. Coordination is extremely important. And I like to make analogies to economics. Uh, you know, actually a complex economy, uh, like the global economy with seven billion people interacting, is quite similar in many respects uh, to the human body with one trillion cells interacting. Uh, and you really need the same theoretical tools to understand both, uh, which is one reason why uh, we understand economies so poorly and we understand biology so poorly. Um, so here's an example. Uh, I want you to think for a moment about the role of prices in coordinating economic activity. Uh, so this is a very simple point in economics. Commodities prices help to coordinate activity. Uh, in the blue are real gasoline prices. When prices go up, people drive less. So red is vehicle miles driven in the US. And so we see that, that pattern. Um, so prices do two things. They transmit information uh, about and they influence uh, what people should do. They tell you uh, when gas prices are high, they tell oil companies you should produce more gas and they tell drivers you should drive less. Uh, so prices, the function of prices uh, is to tell people uh, this activity should, this is a good time to indulge this activity, this is an activity that should be avoided right now. Um, and uh, this was a famous passage from a 1945 paper by a fellow who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. Uh, some key points about how prices work, uh, knowledge of the rel relevant facts is dispersed among many people, and so coordination is required. Prices act to coordinate. We must look at the price system as a mechanism for communicating information. Uh, and very significant about it, the economy of knowledge with which it operates. So uh, if you're influenced by the prices, you're trying to decide how much uh, to drive today, uh, you only need to know what the price of gasoline is uh, to figure that out. So if you imagine if we had to hold a meeting every morning, uh, of 300 million people in the U.S. and decide together how much gasoline we're going to produce and uh, who's going to consume how much gasoline today, uh, that would be a big problem. Uh, and it wouldn't be well coordinated. Uh, but uh, by having a commodities price, you can get effective
coordination uh, very inexpensively. And I would encourage you to think of uh, circadian hormones like cortisol and uh, melatonin uh, similarly to prices. So they have that same function. Uh, when cortisol is high, it's saying uh, the price of some activities is high, you should avoid them uh, to cells. And it's saying uh, there's a big reward to performing certain functions, you should perform those functions. Uh, and when the price is low, there's a different set of uh, events and actions that are encouraged and a different set that are discouraged. Uh, so here you see uh, the circadian rhythm and it gets a few bumps at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, but basically uh, the main rhythm is a circadian 24-hour rhythm. And so getting back to the issue of coordination and the analogy with economies, uh, here's a picture of uh, the Earth's light at the same time at night, something like 10 p.m. Uh, and it turns out uh, the density of light is a very good proxy for GDP, for economic activity in a location. Uh, and here's a blown up uh, portion of Korea. This is one of the most important uh, examples of the significance of institutions in economics. Uh, so North Korea actually had higher income and more economic activity than South Korea before uh, the Korean War and before communism was established in the North. Uh, and uh, so basically, in the communist uh, region, you don't have meaningful prices. Uh, you don't have the same uh, information signals and in incentives that affect people. And you end up with vast differences in economic output. And so continuing this metaphor, uh, I think that gives us some insight into why circadian rhythms can be so important for health. Uh, if GDP is the output of a coordinated economy, health is the output of a coordinated body. Uh, if the endo endocrine clock coordinates the body just as prices coordinate economies, uh, then disrupted rhythms will lead to bad health in the same way uh, that we know that disrupted prices uh, lead to poverty in places like North, Cor North Korea. Okay, so uh, before I address practical aspects, I want to look at a, a little more detail into uh, the rhythms in the body and how they interact. Uh, and so let's look at a little bit of biology. Um, uh, on the left are plots of the two main uh, uh, hormones that uh, represent the endocrine clock, uh, melatonin and cortisol. Uh, on the right is another clock, core body temperature. Uh, but, you know, so we have multiple rhythms in the body. And let's look at melatonin and cortisol. Uh, that's very interesting. They both have a 24-hour rhythm, but they're phase shifted by six hours. So if you look at the peak of melatonin, it's about three hours, uh, 3 a.m. at night. Uh, peak of cortisol, about 9 a.m. Um, uh, body temperature is also phase shifted relative to those two. Uh, but why do we need multiple uh, rhythms? You think if the rhythm is in a 24-hour cycle, one hormone would be enough to communicate that. Uh, what's the benefit of having two hormones on the same rhythm? Well, uh, that's actually not hard to understand. If you think about a computer clock, uh, you know, computers have one clock, and they have two states, a state of a high state and a low state, and two times for action, a rising edge and a falling edge. Uh, what happens if you phase shifted, if you created a second computer clock phase shifted uh, by a quarter cycle, that would be six hours on a 24 hour cycle. Well, then if you look at the two clocks, uh, you'll now have four states instead of two. Uh, a state with both high, one high, one low, one low, one high, and both low. And so imagine that an external driver like solar light, which drives a 24-hour cycle, imagine it's very valuable to have these prices. All right, and imagine you have a lot of action sets in the body that need to be coordinated, independent action sets where you'd like to do all the actions together, 
uh, and you've got one action set, another action set, another action set, another action set, then one rhythm, which only has a high and a low state, isn't enough. Uh, you want to have more states. If you have uh, two rhythms, phase shifted by six hours, then you get these four states. Uh, and you can have more independent action sets from the one exogenous driver. Okay, and why are rhythms circadian and why is light the primary time giver? Well, that's far and away the most reliable clock. You know, first of all, it's good to have an exogenous clock giving you time uh, because that's cheap. You don't have to maintain a clock internally. Um, but secondly, it's good to have a very reliable clock. So there are lots of other time givers, uh, including food intake. Uh, but in our ancestral environment, there's going to be times when food is scarce and you can't find food for several days. Uh, there are going to be times when you're extremely busy, you have to keep moving or something and you can't sleep. Uh, so even though there are many things in our behavior, in our environment, which vary on a uh, diurnal cycle, uh, uh, sunlight is going to be a major driver of circadian rhythms just because it's so extremely reliable and in our ancestral environment we were sure to go outside every day and see the sun all right so that's going to be important but if exogenously driven rhythms are really important for our health uh, then it shouldn't be surprising that the body might seek out extra drivers of rhythms and we might have many rhythms and there's even some evidence recently that we might have a circulunar clock driven by the phases of the moon. Uh, and of course, this is much weaker uh, than our solar clock. Uh, but it does illustrate how helpful it can be for biological coordination to have these clocks uh, to give us more uh, time scales on which uh, coordinated action can happen and more different states in the body. Uh, you know, so if you have an extra 28-hour clock, you're, you know, each extra clock is doubling the number of action states you can have. All right. Now, rhythms are not just hormonal. So the hormones represent what's called the uh, endo endocrine clock. Uh, but in fact, every cell has its own clock. Uh, there are circadian rhythm genes. Uh, they are expressed on a circadian rhythm, and uh, so you see a few examples over there on the left. Um, I want you to look at this plot uh, from lung explants. And on this plot, the horizontal scale is circadian time in days. Uh, so every one of those cycles is a 24-hour cycle. And what you see is that when you take cells out of the body and culture them, uh, and so they lose all of the exogenous inputs and the inputs from the rest of the body driving the circadian clock, uh, they'll maintain a circadian cycle. Um, it actually lengthens very slightly in uh, free running, tends to go toward 26 hours or so. Uh, but the main effect is that the amplitude of gene expression decays of these circadian genes. And you can see it goes down every day. Uh, it persists for over a week, but the amplitude is lower every day. And so we need to keep giving our circadian clocks these external stimulators in order to maintain the proper amplitudes. Uh, okay, um, now this one seems to be washed out and is not showing up, but um, every one of these little codes is a circadian oscillator in the brain. So they're each uh, another clock and they're color coded. It's very hard to see. Uh, but the ones in red, like the olfactory bulb and the suprachiasmatic nucleus, are uh, basically uh, thought to be independent oscillators. They're uh, influenced by one thing, either smell or light. Um, the ones in blue are considered to be semi autonomous oscillators and that they have their own uh, source of influence which drives them but they're also influenced by other clocks mostly the central clock and the suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, and then there are some that are considered to be slave clocks and that they'll be driven by uh, uh, the central clock uh, 
Um, but I, I'm going to put it to you in a moment that uh, there's no such thing as a, as a, as a complete slave. Uh, there are going to be exogenous influences on every clock. Uh, but it's difficult to discover them when they're weak and the influence of the central clock is very strong. All right. There's also, when you go outside the brain, uh, there are many peripheral clocks. Uh, peripheral clocks present in nearly every tissue and organ system. So here we're looking at the organ level um, or at the functional level, uh, things like metabolism, immunity, reproduction, um, and the tissues associate them. And you know, so we see circadian rhythms in uh, activity and functions. Uh, you know, so just like um, I talked about action sets earlier, when you're in different phases of the circadian cycle, uh, cells perform different functions, different actions. <laughs> so for instance, antibody formation uh, happens at night. Uh, and you know, so if you have disrupted sleep, disrupted night rhythms, you won't form antibodies well. So different aspects of immune function occur at different times of day. The body partitions uh, different activities so that uh, you have energy available, you know, resources available for what each thing needs. So if you need to do hunting during the day, you know, then resources will be partitioned toward uh, muscle and other things that you need to hunt effectively. Uh, and then things that would compete with that, uh, like certain immune functions, will be partitioned toward night and other times when you don't need to hunt. So uh, it's quite beneficial to uh, achieve these partitioning of different action states. But if you have a trillion clocks in your body uh, and they have to be coordinated in order to coordinate all the different functions, make sure one cell coordinates its activity with other cells, uh, all the actions, uh, the action states are coordinated, then you've got a problem and uh, you know, so this paper asks, how can light establish phase coherence, if that's the driver, uh, in cells of opaque organisms? Obviously, you need communication from the retina to the central clock to the rest of the body. Uh, and that can be a challenge. It's definitely all of this coordination can easily be a failure point in health. Okay, and now there's an old view which is outdated. Uh, that uh, the coordination is achieved by a master-slave relationship. Uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the master. Everything else is the slave. Uh, causality runs from the SCN to every place else. Uh, there's no feedback from the periphery back. Uh, and only the SCN matters. So uh, the peripheral clock is driven just by that. Uh, more modern view is a more uh, conductor orchestra model. Uh, the SCN has an outsized influence. Uh, it's the conductor of the orchestra, uh, but the players in the orchestra have the potential to uh, become autonomous and run up. And uh, there's lots of studies now that show that the peripheral clocks can be independent. Now, I would argue that, uh, like I said earlier, everything in biology uh, requires dense networks. And there's been evolutionary pressure uh, since life originated to evolve toward greater complexity, more density of networks. And what that means is there's going to be, you know, each clock is going to have some measure of independence, and each clock is going to influence every other clock. And any exogenous influence, which influence one clock, uh, will have ramifications through the rest of the clock network. So there's going to be many influential clocks, many exogenous time givers. All right, so let's look at practical applications. How do we optimize our health? How do we stimulate and manage our rhythms? Uh, German word, Zeitgeber, a very important time giver. Uh, it's a translation. External cues that drive circadian rhythms. Uh, the main known Zeitgebers, uh, light exposure, ambient temperature, social interactions, exercise, and meal time. Now there's probably many more Zeitgebers. There are a number of that have been hypothesized and proposed. Uh, you know, for instance, individual micronutrients 
could be like the birth sodium that's been proposed for instance. You know, so each micronutrient has effects, uh, specific effects throughout the body that may specifically affect, you know, some uh, peripheral clock. And if you take that nutrient, you know, suppose you supplement on a weird schedule, that might affect the circadian clock. Um, so anything could be a low level zeichenberg, but the, more, the lower the level, the harder it is to prove. And they've been steadily you know, doing research and finding more and more peripheral and low level zeichenberg. Um, most important zeichenberg, the light dark zeichenberg. Um, here's a paper with a, uh, an approximation to how influential different frequencies of light are to uh, shifting melatonin rhythms, uh, which is a easy way to measure how much they influence the circadian clocks. And down below I've matched up uh, the color frequencies. You can see red and yellow have almost no effect on the central clock. Uh, green light has minimal effect. Uh, blue and blue-purple have the most. But uh, 400 is the limit of our vision. Even ultraviolet light has an impact. So ultraviolet light matters more than green light in setting circadian rhythms. And this primacy of blue and UV light is why sunlight is such a powerful uh, zeitgeber and uh, why it's very easy for uh, indoor light to be less effective. Um, there are some studies uh, for some applications. Uh, the biological effect of 750 lux of blue light of the right frequency, the peak in that uh, influence curve can be as effective as 2,000 lux of uh, cool white light indoors. And so the brightness that you perceive on your eyes is not necessarily a good indicator of how effectively you're improving your circadian rhythm. And you'll notice these uh, light boxes that you can get at Amazon uh, will shine blue light specifically because that's the most effective uh, at addressing some of these conditions. Uh, the best thing to do in the day, seek bright sunlight. Uh, when you have to be indoors, make the light bright and blue. It's good to choose your light bulbs appropriately. So they sell different types of bulbs. Uh, you'll most often see cool bulbs, and you know everybody wants to be cool, so uh, you know that, that's a big selling point. But actually those are the worst bulbs uh, to get to for the day. You see the spectrum over here, it's heavily in the red, orange, and yellow. Uh, these are fluorescent bulbs, that's why they have these peaks. If you got on a cool incandescent bulb, it would have even less in the blue. Uh, down there, it's hard to see in the green, but that's a natural light uh, fluorescent bulb from Philips. And you see that uh, the spectrum mostly peaks in the blue, uh, near the peak frequencies. And that's actually, sunlight also peaks in the blue and ultraviolet. Um, and so uh, there's also an intermediate type of bulb. I think it's warm bulbs. Uh, so ideally, uh, to shape your environment, what you should do is don't buy any of those cool bulbs. They're not good either at night or in the day. Uh, not enough stimulation in the day, too much at night. Uh, you should get uh, red, yellow, or amber lighting for the night. You should get natural light bulbs for the day, have, you know, switches. You know, one switch that turns on your daytime lighting, one switch that turns on your nighttime lighting, and be able to adjust your light. Uh, okay, there's also an ambient temperature zeichenberg. Uh, I pointed out earlier, body temperature is a circadian oscillator. Ambient temperature somewhat drives uh, body temperature. Uh, so ambient temperature should roughly track your body temperature rhythm. It's good to get warmer temperatures in the daytime, cooler temperatures at night. Um, here's the result of an experiment in camels, uh, but there's probably something similar in other mammals, including humans. Uh, if you expose them to normal light, uh, but you change the ambient temperature so that it is on a different phase, uh, you can actually shift melatonin rhythms by up to one to four hours in different camels. Uh, if you lower the light, so the light uh, zeichenberg is, is less salient, uh, then the ambient temperature rhythms can shift melatonin up by up to eight hours. 
if you have zero light, uh, and it's actually steady light, uh, same amount of light at all times, then uh, the body temperature rhythm will shift uh, to the ambient temperature rhythm. will have the maximum impact on melatonin uh, and others. So how should you manage the temperature zeit Um You should make your environment warm during the day, cool at night. And I'm sure you've noticed if you're in a situation where it's a very hot uh, summer day and, uh, and you don't have air conditioning, it can be very hard to fall asleep. Uh, warm temperatures inhibit sleep. Uh, cool environments promote drowsiness. Uh, I've noticed that in Georgia, uh, everything's air conditioned and the temperature is very low during the day. Uh, and it seems like uh, the air conditioning often gets turned down at night, uh, probably to save money and energy. Uh, but the result is it's warmer at night and cooler during the day. And that's exactly what you'd want to do to disrupt circadian rhythms and cause everybody to become obese. Um, <laughs> all right, so a food sector bar, uh, that's also extremely important. Uh, it again uh, can strongly phase shift uh, rhythms, what you want to do to manage them. Uh, you want to coordinate food intake with sun, with daylight, sun exposure, bright light exposure. Uh, and it's desirable to do intermittent fasting. Now, amplitudes matter. You know, I showed earlier the decay of amplitudes uh, when you take cells out. Uh, you want to drive your circadian rhythms with the right amplitude. And you want to drive the food clock uh, with a good amplitude. And so it's important, actually, to do intermittent fasting and have an overnight fast. Um, and now, the interesting thing, uh, I mentioned earlier the central clock uh, was thought to be entirely independent of other clocks. Uh, here's an example where it's not. Uh, with normal food intake, uh, the central clock is independent, and light is its only influence. But under calorie restriction, uh, the timing of food intake starts to influence and entrain rhythms in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And so nighttime eating uh, can shift all clocks, including the central clock, uh, and specifically under calorie restriction. So if you're on a weight loss diet and you eat at night, uh, your food will be in training daytime rhythms in the central clock, and that means every clock in the body in the nighttime. And the light will be in training in the daytime, so you'll have disrupted rhythms. And so for dieters, if you're a food coach or someone for dieters, it's extremely important, don't eat at night. Um, and in mice, if you give them ad libitum, ad libitum access to food, so they can eat 24 hours a day, uh, and they will, then they tend to have short lifespans. If you just enforce intermittent fasting, uh, they'll tend to live much longer. And that's true even if they end up eating the same amount of calories uh, and exactly the same food. Okay, so just having this food zeitgeber driven uh, with a circadian rhythm, uh, high access to high intake of food at one time of day, low access at another, uh, can greatly extend lifespan. So uh, food is a very important zeitgeber. There's also a social interaction zeitgeber. Uh, social interaction is influential. Um, we should have a lot more interactions during the day than we do at night. Um, and this was something uh, that I first saw in Seth Roberts' uh, blog. This, even though it's only one person's results had made a big impression on me. Uh, viewing human faces in the morning improved mood and sleep. Viewing faces at night impaired mood. And so that the existence of a social zeitgeber was first proposed in the 80s based on a uh, very strong correlation uh, between circadian rhythm disruption and mood disorders and depression. Uh, and a lot of mental health disorders are highly connected uh, to circadian rhythms. And it appears that uh, and you know, so questions of causality were raised, the possibility that social interactions are really zeitgeber. We know prisoners in solitary confinement have terrible health there, uh, and very often terrible health uh, suggests uh, disruption of circadian rhythms because that's such a strong driver of health. 
and uh, there have been a lot more experiments supporting uh, the reality of a social interaction zeitgeber and a social interactions clock in the brain. And that can help explain uh, some various paradoxes. So here's a paradox. Uh, studies find terrible health effects to watching television. Uh, one Australian study found that every hour you watch TV takes 22 minutes off your life. All right, so it better be a really good show. Um, but it's funny. When you look at office workers uh, who are sedentary, they work on the computer all day, uh, they really, their health is just as good as everybody else's. Uh, so it seems like looking at an office computer is not bad for you, uh, but looking at a television is terrible. So what's the difference? Well, I think uh, the main difference, two main differences, TV viewing occurs at night, all right? So insofar as the TV is giving you bright blue lights, that's disrupting your circadian rhythm. But also, TV viewing is very social. So salient thing about the previous slide I just showed, Seth Roberts didn't need to interact with real people in order to improve his mood. He just needed to look at faces on a computer screen. And uh, similarly, Voight, you don't need to talk to real people. You can hear their voices. You can watch videos on YouTube. Uh, and you can watch television. And so the brain doesn't necessarily distinguish between these virtual social interactions and real ones. And all right, so both enhance rhythms. That means uh, if they're daytime rhythms, then doing these things at night can disrupt rhythms. Uh, physical activity is a zeitgeber. Um, another puzzle, uh, the benefits of exercise, health benefits of exercise are not correlated with fitness, all right, or weakly correlated. Um, so doing more exercise makes you healthier, but uh, there's actually a peak in the health benefits of exercise around you know, the equivalent of 30 minutes of running a day. Uh, and if you do more, then uh, there's, you're sti it's still going to be beneficial for nearly everyone, but there's a minority who seem to get negative health effects, as you know, maybe 7 to 10 percent as you go to more intense exercise. You know, but they're still getting more fit, but their health is getting worse. And there's some other factors like exercise induces brain myogenesis. Uh, that's also influenced by circadian rhythms. It's obvious why exercise might induce muscle myogenesis, but why does it do it in the brain also? Maybe through circadian rhythms. And if you think about all these factors, what's the perfect way to reset circadian rhythms? Uh, you want to affect all of the rhythms. Uh, they all interact. They all, have, because it's a dense network, Every zeitgeber affects every clock. Uh, so you want to affect every element. If you think of what happens when you go camping, you're getting sun all day, you're getting hiking, physical activity during the day, you're getting campfires and dim light at night, no blue light, uh, social interactions during the day with your friends. There are temperature rhythms. It's always warm in the daytime, cooler at night when you go outdoors. Uh, so you'd expect camping to be very effective. And a paper just came out a month ago it was extremely effective uh, and highly beneficial for circadian rhythms. And one last point, uh, cancer. The single most important uh, influence upon cancer risk is probably circadian rhythms. And there are a number of spontaneous cures of cancer uh, that have been reported. And the most common element in all those cases is what they decided to do was quit work and go camp and go exploring in the national parks and go camping and go hiking and be in nature. And uh, so this is a very effective way to improve health. And all right, so here is the rhythmic lifestyle that you should follow. Go outdoors. Uh, if you're indoors, get bright blue light. Get social interactions during the day. Get exercise every day. Uh, eat. On an intermittent fasting schedule, try and make your meal timing coincide with daylight. Uh, at nighttime, you want to minimize that social zeitgeber. That doesn't mean no relationships, but they should be comfortable relationships. They should be with people you're intimate with, comfortable with, uh, laughing in drama, and get a good night's sleep. And Shakespeare called sleep the balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. And circadian rhythms uh, really are 
the best nourisher of our health. Thank you both. Um, does anybody have any Zeitgebers? Questions? <laughs> uh, one or two questions. Uh, the next presentation will start in about three or four minutes. Great talk. I liked your analogy of prices and hormones. One question I have, um, your prescription here goes somewhat at odds with Art Devaney's idea of being fractal and mixing it up. And I find actually that I like having a little bit of variety. Um, that kind of variability that we hear is good for us. So how do you reconcile the two? Is there a way to get some happy medium between being rhythmic but not too rigid? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to have both. Oops, sorry. Resuming now. It's easier to achieve uh, good circadian rhythm and training. So in fact, uh, you can get the physical activities I cover by doing intense exercise for 10 minutes, that's enough. Uh, you can do uh, running for 20 minutes. You can do jogging for 30 minutes. You can do walking for an hour or two. All right. Right, yeah, so afternoon is best uh, for exercise. Uh, you know, so different times of day have relevance, uh, but you know, it's okay to exercise early evening, uh, early morning. You know, I think that more or less follows the body temperature clock, uh, and the body temperature has a broad plateau. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's good, uh, you know, if you have weekly variation in exercise, that's good for fitness gives you recovery time. Uh, being more fit makes it easier for you to achieve good circadian rhythm entrainment. Uh, but I think the health benefits come through the circadian rhythm entrainment. And if you have a sedentary job like sitting at a desk, I think you should make a point of getting some activity every day. Uh, perfectly outdoor activity so you get the light at the same time. Thanks, Paul, for a great talk. I was curious about eating to hear more about eating during the daylight, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And I was curious if you could talk about how that re relates seasonally, the seasonal change. So of course, you know, there's a lot more sun during the summer than during the winter, and that really changes our eating window. And, you know, could you talk more about that? Yeah. All right. Well, I think in most of our evolutionary history, the population density was largely concentrated probably within you know, plus or minus 20 degrees of the equator. and. Uh, you know, so there was not a tremendous seasonal variation. Uh, but, you know, clearly when you live at northern latitudes and, uh, you know, the day daytime is short in the winter, uh, you know, what you should do to entrain that is, you know, you make your own virtual 12-hour window. And even if the sun goes down, uh, you know, you can have bright blue indoor lights and, you know, make that daytime for yourself. So you can still combine it with work, and you know if your strategy is to finish eating by 8 p.m., you know you can still execute that through the winter. You're, we have the ability now to shape environments and give ourselves bright blue indoor light. But I think it is, it does emphasize the importance of you know not just willy nilly putting cool uh, light bulbs in your home. Uh, indoor light can be extremely dim compared to sunlight. You know, we don't realize it because our eyes adapt to the bright sunlight very quickly, and uh, they narrow. But indoor light is much, much dimmer than outdoor light. And if you're using bulbs that peak in the, the red or yellow, you're getting very little stimulation. Uh, and so, I think it is important to shape your environment and concept, consciously shape uh, feeding times and other zeitgebers so that. Uh, you optimize rhythms. And, uh, you know, some people do have peculiar schedules and they do want to phase shift their own personal rhythms relative to the sun. Uh, and that's, uh, oh, that's maybe not perfect, but it's pretty good. <laughs>